join Forum IS Academy, trusted by hundreds of toppers, including IS Rank 1 Shruti Sharma. Hello and welcome to Forum IS. This is Indumati. Today's date is 28th April 2023 and these are all the articles which we are going to discuss today. Let us move on to the first article. It is about nuclear power. Should we phase out nuclear power? Should India move towards eliminating nuclear power from our energy mix? That is the question. So, why this article has come up in the newspaper in the first place? It is because Germany has shut down last of its nuclear power plants and France, they are also struggling to replace their aging nuclear reactors. So, France has the maximum nuclear capacity. It is considered as a nuclear powerhouse. A country of such stature, they are also struggling to replace their aging nuclear reactors. That is why should India also go in this direction of completely phasing out nuclear power, that is why this article has come in the news. So what is the global outlook for nuclear power? What are the world countries doing in respect to nuclear power? After the Ukraine war, nuclear power is seeing a renaissance in Europe and US and particularly China. China, they have always been surging forward with respect to nuclear power and South Korea, the South Korean head of state, he had come out with a policy saying that South Korea wants to increase the share of nuclear power to 30% of all their energy sources by 2030, which is a very ambitious target. Even in Japan, after the Fukushima disaster of 2011, Japan actually stopped using a nuclear power. But Japan has restarted 10 nuclear power plants. If a country which has faced nuclear disaster, they have restarted, that means nuclear power has a potential. Japan cannot import expensive coal. It will be very expensive for them to import coal. They don't have the wherewithal to do hydropower. So in that case, a very viable option for Japan is nuclear power. That is why they are even restarting nuclear power plants. Even the UK, they have said that without scaling up nuclear power, we won't be able to decarbonize the electricity sector. Otherwise, we will be heavily dependent on coal and other petroleum products to produce electricity, which will be carbon intensive. So, if you see, barring Germany and France, many other countries are actually looking towards nuclear power. And uh, what is the alternative that is proposed by countries like Germany and France for nuclear power? That is solar power and wind power. But the problem with these kind of wind and solar energy is that they are intermittent. They are intermittent. Wind energy is variable. Sometimes there is wind, sometimes there is no wind. Solar energy is also intermittent in subtropical countries. But nuclear power is firm dispatchable power. Firm power is it is constantly available. And if there is no wind, you can also say that uh, when there is wind, we can produce the electricity using wind power and we can store it in batteries. But then batteries are also an expensive technology. Even batteries have environmental impact because batteries are made of lithium. The lithium discharge is obviously having an environmental impact. So, compared to that, nuclear power is more viable than solar and wind power. And many countries 
like germany and france they want to shut down plants especially germany is literally shutting down the plants right but there is some cost of carbon in the cement so to produce the cement that went into building of the nuclear power plants that are being shut down by germany to produce cement cement is a energy intensive industry energy intensive and we require limestone coal etc for producing cement so already that environmental cost has been met and using this only they have produced the cement and using this cement the nuclear power plant is being built now if we are shutting down this nuclear power plant well before its age if we are shutting it down prematurely then what happens to the environmental cost of the energy that is spent in producing this cement so it is a not a environmentally sound decision that is also one of the criticism that is made against germany another thing is about nuclear safety these days nuclear safety uh, the nuclear power plants are built with active rather than passive safety we'll see what is this active rather than passive safety in older designs like uh, in the era of fukushima and all there needs to be active cooling pumps only if the cooling pumps work then only the nuclear production facility can cool down the problem with fukushima was that when the tsunami came the power plant was not able to cool down and that led to the disaster but these days there are systems like uh, passive cooling systems where even if the power fails the nuclear plant itself it will gradually and gracefully cool down it will gradually cool down even if there is no power available in fukushima the power failed so these active cooling pumps couldn't work that's why the disaster happened but today in the modern design even if the power fails the cool down can happen gradually and gracefully so we need not worry as much about the safety when compared to the fukushima era and another thing is cost the nuclear power plants are typically very costly to build but then today we have something called as small modular reactors which are not that costly to build so cost factor is also being ameliorated so with all these benefits nuclear power is still a viable option and another problem with respect to nuclear power plant is nuclear liability so in jetapur in maharashtra a nuclear power plant is being built by a french company the problem with it is this project is not going forward because of the nuclear liability now what is nuclear liability in case an accident or disaster happens who is responsible who will pay the money to the aggrieved so that is what is liability who will pay so according to indian government as per our nuclear liability the supplier that is the company which set up the nuclear power plant they will pay right so that is why the french company is not going forward they can't afford to pay so that is why they are not going forward but one more thing is that it's not just about money it is about criminal liability uh, more than the money they will be subject to criminal liability which no multinational company or western company will take over so maybe we need some amendments with respect to our nuclear liability and see the practical benefit of nuclear power see we'll explain using the example of kudankulam the capacity is 1000 megawatt and even if the kudankulam plant is a uh, operated at 90% plant load factor that is 90% capacity even then only 25% 25 tons or 5% enriched uranium is needed that is 
फाइव परसेंट एनरिच यूरेनियम मीन्स वॉट इन दैट यूरेनियम इन दैट ट्वेंटी फाइव टन फाइव परसेंट इज ओनली दि फिसल मटीरियल दिस विल ओनली दिस मटीरियल विल ओनली बी स्प्लिट एंड एज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ दिस स्प्लिटिंग ऑफ दि न्यूक्लियस ऑफ यूरेनियम एनर्जी विल बी प्रोड्यूस राइट सो even if the kodam kulam plant is operated at 90% plant load factor or 90% capacity only 25 tons of uranium is required but if you have to produce same amount of electricity using coal you require 5 million tons of coal which is very huge and not only that if we are burning this much of coal tons and tons of ash will be generated and this ash will contain heavy metals like lead and that again will pollute the ground water compare this with just 25 tons of fissil uranium so that way also practically nuclear power is useful what should be the way forward we saw what are all the practical benefits even though many criticism is there for nuclear power we have debunked it so what is the way forward how do we expand our nuclear capacity now npcil nuclear power corporation of india limited they operate all the nuclear power plants in india so in that case a single company can't afford to do even if we are expanding the number of nuclear power plants in our country a single company can't do that it doesn't mean we are asking for privatization we can allow companies like national thermal power corporation they can also come into nuclear power plant business and they can also be allowed to operate nuclear power plants why this needs to be done even though people are criticizing even though we have some viable options why do we need nuclear power plants in the first place because India has promised according to the Paris goals that we will achieve carbon neutrality by 2070 what is carbon neutrality amount emitted amount of greenhouse gases emitted that will be equal to amount that is absorbed so this is carbon neutrality it doesn't mean you will be stopping any emission altogether whatever you are emitting you will be absorbing it back that is carbon neutrality so india has promised to achieve this carbon neutrality by 2070 and if we have to achieve this we have to emit less that is one of the ways of achieving it and if we go to nuclear technology we will be only then we will be able to achieve this carbon neutrality target so that is why nuclear power is necessary and there are enough safeguards for them to be operated so that's it about this article next we will move to rising sea levels that is the article of discussion so what is the context why is this in newspaper because the state of the global climate 2022 report was published and who published this report wmo world meteorological organization they published this report state of the global climate 2022 and it came out just last week and this is important for prelims okay so what is the report say The report says that Antarctic sea ice fell to its lowest extent and melting of some European glaciers was literally off the charts that much bleak the scenario is so if there is melting of sea ice as well as melting of glaciers at a rapid rate then it will lead to sea level rise but what the sea level rise means what does it mean when sea level is rising it has impact on the coastal areas the communities that live in the coastal areas who are dependent on the coastal areas and if the sea level is rising it will 
come into land we will be losing land how will be dealing with loss of land so when we talk about sea level rise these are all the issues that we are con uh, talking about we have to deal with these issues so according to this report how much is the sea level rising global mean sea level that is gsml hereafter in this discussion i will refer to sea level rise as gsml so the report says that the gsml rise has doubled between the first decade of satellite record and the last that means 1993 to 2002 we take it as the first decade of satellite record at that time it was 2.27 mm per year and in the decade between 2013 to 2022 the sea level rise has been 4.62 mm per year so we can see that it has almost doubled so the sea level rise the rate of sea level rise has doubled and how do we measure the sea level it's not like we have a big scale or a measuring tape to measure it right so uh, how do we measure it we use something called as satellite altimeters so what happens is that from the satellite so from the satellite imagine that this is a satellite from the satellite radar pulses are sent to the sea surface okay so this radar pulses are sent then they will go back right they will reflect and go back to the satellite the time that is taken by these radar pulses to get back and what is the change in the intensity using this the time taken by this radar pulse to get back to the satellite and what is the change in intensity of the radar pulse that will help in measuring the depth of the sea level so if it reaches very quickly then the sea level has risen okay so that is how the sea level rise is measured so the higher the sea level the faster and stronger the return signal if it is taking very long to return back that means the sea level is not risen that much if it is taking very long to reach back the intensity will also reduce with time right so if it returns back faster and stronger then there is a higher sea level that is how they measure using the satellite altimeters okay so what has led to sea level rise what is the reason behind sea level rise the first thing is ocean warming in global warming the oceans get more warmer because it takes more time for the ocean to get heated up and more time for water to lose heat so ocean warming ice loss from glaciers and ice sheets changes in land water storage these are all the reasons why sea level is rising so there is increased concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases 90% of the extra heat is stored in oceans why this is so because water is lower to heat and it will lose heat also very slowly that means we are telling that in layman terms technically speaking the specific heat of water is very high specific heat of water is high that is why it is not losing heat that easily right so when ocean is retaining heat then what happens there is thermal expansion we know that whenever a body is heated it will expand so if the ocean water gets heated it will expand and it leads to sea level rise and another reason for sea level rise is the thinning of cryosphere so we saw right the loss of ice from glaciers and ice sheets that is cryosphere what is cryosphere this is very important for our prelims what is cryosphere arctic and antarctic regions glaciers ice sheets of greenland and antarctica seasonal snow cover and permafrost what is permafrost mass of land that remains below 0 degree celsius 
for at least two straight years that is consecutive years so you have to know what is cryosphere that is very important and what is permafrost permafrost is the mass of land that has remained below 0 degree celsius for two years at least two consecutive years that is the condition for permafrost this is also important for prelims okay this definition is important so these are all the reasons for sea level rise and what will sea level rise lead to what problems it will cause it will change the land cover what will be land and what will be sea will change because sea water will intrude into the land we will be losing there will be coastal erosion so if you see in this picture they are showing coastal erosion and this picture is from west bengal so see we are losing land that is one thing one impact another thing is coastal communities will face acute shortage of land for human use because there is coastal erosion and when there is land crunch the people who are richer who are better off they can migrate to other places and they can face this they can cope with this crisis but poor people would not be able to displace so it increases social disparities also and if there is rise in sea temperature it also leads to rise in number of cyclones you would have studied in geography right the ocean temperature should be around 27 degree celsius for the cyclones to form it should be heated to that much level for cyclones to form right so if there is rise in sea temperature there will be increase in number of cyclones for example recently in 2 months in in 2 months almost 4 to 8 cyclones happened in south africa and this leads to massive economic damage it will lead to large economic liability and when there is more sea water it will intrude and it will also make the ground water as more saline so these are all the impacts that sea level rise would cause so we saw what is happening why there is sea level rise and what will be the impact of sea level rise <coughs> so here you see uh, by 2000 2100 the sea level rise could hit 2 meters if it reaches the 2 meters see particularly focus on this data 57 million people will be affected in south asia which is a very very bleak statistic these many people where will they go right so that is the scale in which we are suffering so action needs to be taken to limit the change in global average temperature within 1.5 degree celsius as per paris agreement if not at least we have to limit it within 2 degree celsius more than this if the sea level rises then the sea level would rise as much as 80 cm as much as 1 meter which is a worst case scenario we should not let that happen so countries should stick on to their paris agreement commitments so that we don't reach this state of affairs which is very bleak okay so moving on to the next article it is about the sudan crisis from sudan in sudan there is a crisis happening between the rapid support forces and the sudanese armed forces there is infighting between the, these two forces so there is a crisis in sudan and indians who are standard in stranded in sudan are being evacuated by government of india under operation kaveri so this might be asked in prelims this is very important in this operation kaveri uh, several ships have gone to evacuate indian citizens one of the ship is ins tarkash then we have ins sumedha and ins teg so they might ask in prelims INS Tarkash INS Sumedha and INS Teg they were seen in the context of what so they can give option a they were uh, used in a military exercise b they are research vessels 
see they were used for evacuating citizens something like that they can give so this is how questions are formed so how are they being evacuated is they are first transported from port sudan to jeddah in saudi arabia from saudi arabia they are flown to india we'll see the map okay so here we have jeddah which is the in the coast of saudi arabia here we have port sudan from there indian citizens are being not only indian citizens persons of indian origin they are also transported from port sudan to jeddah and from jeddah they are flown back to india so this is what is being done by government of india now we will see some map pointings in sudan we have the nubian desert and the libyan desert the river nile flows through sudan both of its tributaries the blue nile and the white nile both of them pass through sudan and the capital of sudan khartoum is located in the bijunction of white nile and blue nile and uh, the port city of sudan is port sudan and it is located in red sea all right so if we can see the west asia map here so we have saudi arabia uh, we have the persian gulf region okay so the persian gulf is separated from the arabian sea through the strait of hormuz it is located here and we have another strait that is the strait of babel mandir which separates red sea and gulf of aden okay so which are all the countries in the arabian peninsula yemen oman uae qatar bahrain is a island country we have kuwait jordan these are all the countries in the arabian peninsula that is for map pointings we'll go to the next article it is about indian army to raise cyber operations and support wings so this is mainly useful as fodder points in your gs3 in the security section of your gs3 so i'll explain this army commanders conference in this particular conference they have decided to operationalize command cyber operations and support wings c c o s w it will be operationalized in the near future so this is to expand the cyber warfare capabilities because these days there is non conventional warfare non conventional warfare wars are not fight on Uh, they are not fought on the ground we are not fighting wars on the ground rather wars are fought in a non conventional scale non conventional meaning the infrastructure of a country is attacked the critical infrastructure of a country like their banking system um, their system for digital transactions these things are at, at, attacked then there is data breaches so this is cyber warfare so in order to better deal with this ccosw will be launched by indian army they will operationalize this mechanism to be more adept in cyber warfare so you can quote it in an answer that is asked in gs3 how well is india prepared for cyber warfare you can say that even army is going to operationalize ccosw that much is the utility you need not go into the nitty gritties of this article last article is about rbi governor asking the banks to assess their risk and bolster their capital buffers why is he saying so he is saying so because of financial instability in some advanced economies and it might have a spillover effect on india so he has asked the bank boards to assess the financial risks and according to this risk he wants the banks to build enough capital buffer so that they are resilient even if there is a 
crisis so um, but what rbi has said is that the health of our banking system is very good because the gross npa ratio for the scheduled commercial banks that is the commercial banks both private and public included it's only 4.41% which used to be almost 9% in the peak npa crisis era of 2017 to 18 but now it has it is just merely 4.41% which is a very healthy number but also we must be very much aware of the financial instability in advanced economies and we banks should build adequate capital and liquidity buffers in case there is a spilling over now what is this capital buffer capital buffers aim to enable banks to absorb losses while maintaining the provision of key services to the real economy so even if there is a loss the banks this capital that is uh, for example in your house you might have some amount set aside for crisis situation right that is what is capital buffer for banks what money we set aside in our families that is called technically as capital buffer for banks and it is not just discretion the banks will not decide how much they will set aside in our home we will decide how much money we need to set aside for any emergency but banks cannot decide banks will have to follow the basel 3 norms and according to basel 3 norms the central banks in india's case rbi rbi will specify the capital adequacy norms how much money the banks have to set aside for any emergency so the cccb what is ccb triple cb is counter cyclical capital buffer that is triple cb what is it so it is calculated as a fixed percentage of a bank's risk weighted loan book so it is supposed to be in the form of equity capital maximum and wait first let us understand what is this bank's risk weighted loan book so let us say there is a abc bank okay what is asset for bank loans are the asset for bank so there are uh, loans okay so there is one loan for 10000 crores one loan for 50 lakhs one loan for 200 crores like that there will be many loans now what is the risk of this loan being defaulted there will be some risk assigned there will be some risk assigned like that for every loan one risk will be assigned then this loan amount and the risk will be multiplied and all these figures will be added and a average will be taken that is the risk weighted loan okay so that is the risk weighted loan and according to that according to that risk weighted loan this percentage so how much percentage has to be maintained as counter cyclical capital buffer will be calculated from this loans are there the risks are calculated this is multiplied and then you get the risk weighted assets okay out of this number a certain percentage say 10% or 12% is maintained as ca counter cyclical capital buffer that is the concept here and how is this maintained it is maintained in the form of equity capital okay so that it can be equity capital means in the form of shares etc so that it can be easily converted to money because equity capital is more liquid right so it can be easily converted and if banks are breaching this norm if they are failing to maintain that what will happen there will be constraints and limits which can be imposed on the bank rbi will impose limits on the bank that you are not maintaining the required counter cyclical capital buffer okay so that is about buffer capital and counter cyclical capital buffer 
so once again before because of the global risk the rbi governor he is asking to maintain the buffers properly in case something comes up okay so that is it in simple terms we will now discuss some previous year questions so the first question in the context of digital technologies for entertainment consider the following statements one in augmented reality a simulated environment is created and the physical world is completely shut out in virtual reality images generated from a computer are projected into real life objects or surroundings third statement ar that is augmented reality allows individuals to be present in the world and improves the experience using the camera of smartphone or pc but fourth statement vr closes the world transposes an individual providing complete immersion experience which of the statements are correct augmented augmented means what you are augmenting something that is improving something the straight meaning for augmented is improving so what happens is that augmented reality is it will supplement the reality now virtual reality it is another reality it is present reality is where we live virtual reality is it is present in the virtual world it is not physically seen you will be transported into a virtual world that is for example if you are doing gaming you are in that gaming in universe right it is a virtual world so you are transported into virtual reality that is vr so if you read these two statements they are interchanged so the definition for virtual reality is given here and the definition for augmented reality is given here so augmented reality is actually images generated from a computer that are projected into real life but virtual reality is a simulated environment created and the physical world is completely shut out so these two statements are wrong because their definitions are interchanged third statement ar allows individuals to be present in the world and it improves what did i say about ar it improves see here also they are saying it improves your experience you can use the camera of your phone and you can project some animals onto your table there is that feature in many android phones you can test it and see so this statement is correct we are closes the world transports an individual providing complete immersion experience yes this is correct that's why we have vr headsets it completely shuts down the re uh, real world right so these two statements are correct and the question is asking about correct answer only 3 and 4 are correct next question the word denisovan is sometimes mentioned in media in reference to a fossils of a kind of dinosaurs b an early human species c a cave system found in northeast india d a geological period in the history of indian subcontinent the answer is an early human species we are homo sapiens right there were many other species of humans like neanderthals one such species is a denisovan okay last question what is cas9 protein that is often mentioned in news a a molecular scissors used in targeted gene editing b a biosensor used in the accurate detection of pathogens in patients c a gene that makes plants pest resistant d a herbicidal substance synthesized in genetically modified crops so there is something called as crispr cas9 which is a technique for gene editing and this cas9 protein it will cut the gene so we have a gene okay imagine that this is the double helical structure so what this cas9 will do is it will cut the gene and this portion can be removed and from another 
DNA, a desired portion can be inserted in place of this. That is the role of Cas9 protein. So, answer is A, a molecular scissor used in targeted gene editing. Okay. So, that's it for today's discussion. Follow us on all the social media channels. I hope your preparation is going in full speed. All the best. Thank you.